I never use approaches that are dangerous in any way. Another thing is that I base all of my evidence on peer-reviewed medical studies, which I read <laughs> a lot. So does diet have any power over dementia? Well, here's a study. Uh, this was done at the, um, actually, they used a MIND diet, which MIND diet is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and an antihypertensive diet designed to lower blood pressure. They were able to lower the age of people so that they delayed dementia for seven and a half years. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, let's keep our minds young as long as possible. What do they do? In this trial, basically, it was a lot of berries, green vegetables, and less animal fat. We can do that, right? This trial, the Rush Memory and Aging Project, uh, lead author is uh, Martha Claire Morris, and she did an excellent job, reported in 2018 in the most prestigious journal, Neurology, the equivalent of 11 years younger on people who ate one to two servings of green vegetables a day compared with people who didn't eat much green vegetables at all. Wow. Our chief neuropsychologist has stated that if we could delay dementia for 10 years, that would be the end of the epidemic. Why? Because it often strikes in the 80s, and if you're dead when it happens, it doesn't bother you, right? <laughs> so let's delay it as much as possible. Unfortunately, the drugs that are used, there's two basic drugs that are used by neurologists to combat Alzheimer's disease. Donepezel, brand named Aricept, is the most common one that is dispensed very freely to those with memory problems. It's FDA approved for mild, well, for moderate and severe Alzheimer's disease, but it's also used for mild Alzheimer's disease and also mild cognitive impairment, kind of the precursor to dementia. Uh, unfortunately, according to this recent study in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, there has minimal effects on cognition, but 76% more vomiting and 62% more diarrhea. That doesn't sound very good, does it? We have some solutions here tonight that do not involve those unpleasant situations, but that work as well or better than donepezil. The other drug that's used is memantine, and memantine is not very effective, and it has some adverse side effects. Blood clots, psychosis, and heart failure are some of the side effects. So it's a good idea to look at safer approaches, don't you think? What about supplements? Can they have any effect on dementia? Well, this study, elders were supplemented with a small amount of synthetic vitamin E, not a good idea, a small amount of vitamin C and some beta carotene for four months. But even this supplementation, which isn't perfect by any means, managed to improve their memory about 15% compared to control group where they did not improve their memory. They stayed about the same. So it may be possible, and in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, I used both dietary changes and also supplements. I want to tell you a little bit about dementia. The term is often misused. In this pie chart, only the two gray pie wedges are not involved with either vascular dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the biggest part of dementia in America, but I would say that it is almost always accompanied by vascular dementia and clogging of the arteries that supply the brain. Good blood perfusion to the brain is essential for us to think. It's one of the reasons why exercise, physical exercise, is really helpful. The incidence of Alzheimer's disease is risen alarmingly and is forecast to continue rising alarmingly. If you take a good look at the American diet and the, how can I say gently, the junk food diets around the world, things are only going to get worse unless people eat better. And also, there are other ways, too, besides nutrition. This is kind of a sad picture because it shows the before and after of Alzheimer's disease. 
On the left, we have a normal brain on the top. And on the right, you see a brain shrunken to about half its size. What has happened is that the brain cells, the neurons themselves, have died, half of them. This is called neurodegeneration. And neither drug used for Alzheimer's disease slows or stops or reverses this neurodegeneration. But we do have tools that can help with that. What we'd like to do is protect the cells in the brain so that they don't die off. And when do you start this process? Prenatal would be a good time. <laughs> through pregnancy, through childhood, through early life, midlife, and late life. So wherever you are, you can benefit from protecting your brain cells. We'd like to have as many left as we possibly can. Now the bottom shows, it's a PET scan, and it shows glucose activity. Glucose activity is more where you see the yellow and the red. Where there's yellow and red, there's more glucose activity. But sadly, look at the Alzheimer's brain on the right, and you see that there's very little activity. And this is reflected in the eyes of those with Alzheimer's disease, with advanced Alzheimer's disease like this. One of the reasons why there's no glucose activity there is, of of course, because of tau tangles and Alzheimer's plaques that I'll mention more about, but also lack of circulation to the brain. And we can greatly aid this circulation to the brain. Vascular dementia is a big contributor. I'll describe that more. And we can reverse vascular dementia, or rather, you can. Plant diets. This is an assembly, a conference about plant diets. So I found a 2019 study here, uh, among many others, that talk about the parts of a plant diet that can be beneficial. Polyphenols are a large class of plant chemicals, including flavonoids, flavones, uh, the still beans such as resveratrol. It's a huge class of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant chemicals in plants. Now, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory mean less brain cell death. So that's one of the ways that these plant diets help. Also, antioxidants fight the free radical damage that destroys the brain cells. So why not have some vitamin C and vitamin E available to the brain? Vitamin E cannot work but once without vitamin C to come and recharge it. Then it can work again. Then you need vitamin C again to recharge it. So the two work together. Carotenoids are the colorful pigments that you see in fruits and vegetables and even yams. These carotenoids are tremendously effective in protecting the brain. They are fat-soluble antioxidants. That means they're very effective in the cell membrane that covers each cell in the brain. And those membranes are often attacked by free radicals, and when they're damaged, or the mitochondrial membranes inside them, then the brain cells can die. Carotenoids are very protective. And where are they found? Fruits, vegetables, and some roots. When they did postmortem studies on Alzheimer's brains, they found that the Alzheimer's brains had lower levels of beta carotene and lutein and other carotenoids. Did you know that lutein is a carotenoid most accumulated in the brain, also in the retina of the eye? And it's an antiomer, zeaxanthin, is also found in the brain and the eye, very protective. And our brains would love to accumulate these carotenoids so that we can protect ourselves from free radical damage. Those fuzz balls in the picture are called amyloid plaque or senile plaque. And they're produced over a long period of time, many decades. Another reason why I'd like people to start early in their defense of their brain. They're involved in about 80% of dementia cases. Do they cause dementia? It's an interesting question. We're not sure. But they certainly are existent more in Alzheimer's brains than not. But there are some very normal old brains with Alzheimer's plaques where there is no memory or cognition problems at all. These are clumps of protein that occur between the nerve cells. They interfere with nerve transmission, and they're very toxic to the brain, killing brain cells. Now, tau tangles occur inside the brain cells, and they're also very toxic. Hyperphosphorylated tau proteins is the big name. We just call them tau tangles, usually. 
the two pictures on the right and the left are pictures of the same thing. You see what I mean? On the left, we have lots of foods, heavy and saturated fat and animal fat. And on the right, we have the result of those foods, clogged arteries. When you eat a diet high in saturated fat, and many American diets are very high in saturated fat, you get an increase of cholesterol in the bloodstream. And you get increased production of amyloid plaques in the brain. The higher the cholesterol, and it gets kind of technical as the cholesterol contributes to the lipid rafts on the membranes of the brain where the transmembrane proteins go through, like the amyloid precursor protein, and it creates more amyloid plaque. Good idea to keep your cholesterol lower anyway for heart disease and stroke risk. Arterial blockage is very common. You've probably heard of some people who have carotid artery blockage in their carotid arteries sometimes 70 or 80% occluded. This means that very little blood can get up to the brain. If you eat a diet lower in saturated fat, you actually can start reducing the blockage in your arteries. And later in the conference, uh, Dr. Esselstyn will come and tell you about how to reverse this clogging the arteries, and i am tell you about it here too. Vascular dementia, which I've mentioned, is really the accumulation of tiny strokes. So first, you eat a lot of saturated fat, and then you get a lot of plaque built up on your arteries. And then a little bit of the plaque breaks away and plugs a tiny arteriole or a capillary. And the branch of brain cells that that feeds dies off. And then it happens again and again and again. Tiny little strokes happening all over the brain, eating up your memories, eating up who you are. This is not necessary, and this is reversible. So, to keep blood cholesterols low, reduce the saturated fat in the diet, which is usually animal fat. Mild cognitive impairment is kind of in between normal aging and dementia. And it's really a broad pattern, because when you first enter mild cognitive impairment, well, you're nearly normal for your age. But when you exit mild cognitive impairment, you're actually in dementia. So the brain is already shrunk by about 10%. We don't want it to shrink to 50%, so that's why I'm here tonight. Tau tangles already in the brain, and the amyloid plaques are in the brain. Memory and thinking is becoming difficult, but in mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, it's still easy enough to take care of yourself, and you don't need help. Mild cognitive impairment tends to lead to dementia. It can be seen as the precursor to dementia. So as you see the graph on the left over here, little by little, people graduate to dementia from mild cognitive impairment, perhaps 10% a year. Estimates vary, different populations vary. But if people continue to do what they're doing when they got mild cognitive impairment, then it's more or less inevitable that they will sooner or later progress to dementia. But we can change our habits. And that's why I'm here today, is to help you change our habits. People in our trial changed their habits, and instead of being just below de dementia, they became quite normal. This is a scale of the mini mental status exam. 20 is kind of the cutoff point for dementia. 25 is the cutoff point for mild cognitive impairment, and this area between 25 and 30 is the normal area. And missing one of the 30 questions is not abnormal at all. That happens, it can happen to anyone. Uh, so how did we do it? What did we do to make this happen? Well, first you get a pretty picture to rest your brains and eyes. Here are the 16 interventions. Now, when I proposed this trial, the scientists I worked with, our statisticians said, no, you're supposed to test one chemical, not 16 diverse things. But my goal was to say, can we reverse dementia? So I wanted to put in all the 16 best things that I had seen evidence for in clinical trials. Randomized, controlled clinical trials from all over the world have shown me that each of these different changes are very helpful. So among the dietary changes, one cup of berries daily. Is there anyone here who already eats one cup of berries daily? 
Great. Anyone here is willing to start eating one cup of berries daily? I'll show you a study later. Great. Fantastic. That shows that an average of two years delayed dementia just with one cup of berries a day and no other interventions. So we specified for our people blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes. Now, blueberries and strawberries are very low in glycemic load, so even people with diabetes seem to be okay with that. It does not increase blood sugar a lot. But they're loaded with enormously helpful antioxidants, anthocyanins, and so on. Walnuts and sunflower seeds were chosen because walnuts are loaded with a gamma tocopherol form of vitamin E. And sunflower seeds are just loaded with the alpha tocopherol form of vitamin E. So by combining the two, we're really covering the bases on that essential element, vitamin E. Now, because the study was done with people 65 years or better, as I like to say, uh, some of these people had diverticuli, bowel pockets, and their doctors forbid them to eat any nuts or seeds. So we had people simply put the nuts in, into a coffee grinder, buzz them up into powder, and then eat them that way without heating. So that meant that everyone could take them. Also, you get a much better digestion of the nutrients inside the nuts and seeds if you grind them up, because your digestive activity can hit all parts of, of it, instead of there being little microscopic mountains that aren't chewed up inside there. We changed cooking methods. And this was to prevent the formation of advanced glycation end products, which I'll tell you about. We also lowered the saturated fat in the diet, and that was the toughest thing that we did. Uh, there was a lot of noncompliance on lowering saturated fat in diet, because that means eating less animal fat. And animal fat's a real favorite of people in Hawaii, and I imagine it is here in New York, too. Okay, we used uh, quite a few supplements. There's four antioxidant minerals that I'll explain. We used a mixed form of vitamin E to supplement the nuts and seeds. We use vitamin C to boost the antioxidant power in the body. We also use coenzyme Q10, which has two effects. One is it's necessary for production of aerobic energy in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. It's essential. And it's also known as ubiquinone. It's ubiquitous everywhere in the body. But as we age, we tend to produce a little less of this coenzyme Q10. So it's very safe, natural in the body. And so we did supplement with that. We also used the folate, uh, the real form of folate, not folic acid, the synthetic form. Folate is safe. The folic acid form has some potential for raising cancer risk if over 1,000 micrograms a day. We used vitamin C and um, vitamin B12. Now, folate and vitamin B12 work together, and I'll show you how that works as we go along. We used SAMe. Does anyone know about s methionine? Yeah, this is naturally made in our bodies if we have enough folate and vitamin B12. But just like the vitamin E, we wanted to do it two different ways because it's so important. Guess what this stuff does? Those genes that everyone's talking about creating Alzheimer's plaques, and some people have more of those genes, this quenches them. It quiets them. It puts them to sleep. So they no longer make the enzymes that make Alzheimer's plaque. Very important if you don't want any progression. And that's one of my goals, is that when people are getting problems with their memory, whatever stage people are in, I ask them, what if you didn't get any worse? What if you could say, as you are today, without this horror of losing your mind completely, uniformly, everyone said, yes, I would take that. So we want to do that, definitely. We use two medical plants. I chose these two because the research on them is just excellent. Medical plants aren't used by American medical doctors or neurologists. Uh, they are used, however, all over the world. These two plants have tons of research, and they're completely safe. There's one possible drug interaction with ginkgo biloba, and I'll mention that as we go through the talk. My website is drsteveblake.com. Please visit if you'd like more information. People talk a lot about antioxidants. Well, antioxidants are needed to protect the brain. They're also needed to protect every other part of our body. It's been estimated that every cell in our body experiences 10,000 to 100,000 free radical attacks every day. Okay, do the math. 
That's a lot of free radical attacks, and we need these antioxidants. Now, some antioxidants come from food or supplements, and other antioxidants are made inside our bodies. The ones from food, the carotenoids, wonderful antioxidants from colorful fruits and vegetables. Vitamin C, found in fruits and vegetables, but not other places, except did you know potatoes have vitamin C? Vitamin E in the natural forms is a beneficial antioxidant, but in the synthetic form, it is of dubious benefit and possible harm. Polyphenols, this large class of protective chemicals and plants, when we talk about a plant diet, I like to talk about a whole plant diet. And I don't say plant-based, I say a whole plant diet. Because if you're eating a whole plant diet, you're getting loads of polyphenols. And these are very protective. As I mentioned, they're antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, very protective of the brain. Now, inside our bodies, we make superoxide dismutase, often abbreviated SOD. This superoxide dismutase is necessary to protect our brain cells. If we don't have it, our brain cells die. So we need it, but it won't work without three different trace minerals, zinc, copper, and manganese. And the manganese is the most important because the manganese form protects the mitochondria inside our brain cells and all other cells. This manganese form of superoxide dismutase is crucial, but are you getting enough manganese? How do you know? Well, there's three ways to know if you're getting enough manganese. You can guess, you can take manganese supplement every day, or you can analyze your diet, using my diet doctor for instance, and find out exactly how much you're getting from food so you're neither guessing nor supplementing. And I, uh, I do both analyze my diet and I also take a supplement too, just to make sure that I'm getting superoxide dismutase charged up. Now another antioxidant enzyme that we have in our brains and elsewhere is glutathione peroxidase. You've probably heard of this. Glutathione peroxidase is this magical ability. It can take hydrogen peroxide and turn it into water, but it can't do it without selenium. You must have selenium. Is everyone sure they're getting selenium every day? Some days I do, most days I do get it from my diet, but not every day. So I supplement, or you can guess. But it, these are crucial antioxidants that are really necessary. Now our bodies make only one fat-soluble antioxidant to protect all the delicate membranes in our, in our brain cells, the out, outside membrane of the brain cell and the mitochondrial membranes inside the brain cell. And that, of course, is coenzyme Q10. So there are the antioxidants wrapped up for you. There are, of course, more than I've mentioned. These are the most important ones for brain health. Okay, now I've got a chart of some diets here. Uh, what I'm looking at is vitamin C and vitamin E in the diets. Now, only 7% of Americans get the bare minimum of vitamin E. No wonder incidence of Alzheimer's disease is raising so fast. 7%, that means in this auditorium, perhaps only a handful of people would be getting enough vitamin E and everyone else would be deficient. And that's the bare minimum of 15 milligrams or 22 and a half IUs per day. We really could use a bit more than that. So in the standard American diet, you don't even get enough vitamin C and the vitamin E is seven, not even half of the minimum daily requirement. On the Atkins diet, well, it came up worse for vitamin C, and vitamin E was only five milligrams. That's a tiny amount. By the way, on the Atkins diet, when I analyzed it, the fiber was under one gram. Kind of makes you wonder how those people poop. <laughs> really scary diet. Uh, the zone diet did pretty good for vitamin C because they're eating a lot of berries and a lot of greens but the vitamin E wasn't high enough. Where do you get vitamin E? Nuts and seeds is where I get mine, avocados and olives. That's a, those are the best sources of vitamin E. In the paleo diet, which is extremely popular, they did get enough vitamin C from berries and uh, fruits and vegetables, but the vitamin E, again, was too low. The bulletproof diet uh, <laughs> did get barely enough vitamin C, but again, low in vitamin E. South Beach diet, same thing. Now, I have a transition vegetarian diet here. A vegetarian diet 
can be a healthy thing or it can be an unhealthy thing. A vegetarian diet that consists of white flour, cheese, and eggs is not a very healthy diet. In fact, the saturated fats often at levels very similar to an American diet where people are eating meat. And they didn't get enough vitamin E or vitamin C because they weren't eating enough fruits and vegetables on this particular diet. The Mediterranean diet got enough vitamin C but not enough vitamin E. What they did get came from olive oil. The vegan whole food diet did a really good job of vitamin C and also vitamin E. Nice on both counts. Now there's some very low fat diets out there. The McDougal diet, the Pritikin diet, the Ornish diet. There's quite a few people advocating a very low fat diet. Unfortunately, vitamin E occurs in fatty foods. So it is impossible to get enough vitamin E on a 10% or lower fat diet. If you get down to 10% of calories, you cannot get enough vitamin E. It's just not possible, unless you got all your calories from vitamin E pills. Uh, the winner was the raw vegan diet, which got 423 milligrams of vitamin C. That's about the highest I've ever seen in any diet. And 45 milligrams of vitamin E, three times the daily minimum. An excellent idea. This study, it looked at the risk of Alzheimer's disease. They looked at supplements in this case, vitamin C and E supplements, and they reduced the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 40%. That's a nice reduction in risk. The, how did they do it? They reduced the neuronal damage and brain cell death caused by oxidative stress, by the damage from free radicals. However, I must caution you, and I'll explain later, that the, what's called vitamin E in vitamin pills is not really vitamin E. So you must be very cautious in choosing your vitamin E. Having written a college textbook on vitamins and minerals from McGraw-Hill, I can say with certainty that the vitamin E that you're getting in almost every supplement is greatly inferior and not at all truly vitamin E. Now another antioxidant, coenzyme Q10, reduces brain damage from oxidation. Perfect. We don't want our brains to shrink down to half like an Alzheimer's person. We want to keep them full, fluffy. The coenzyme Q10 was found to improve brain function in elderly people. It does this by improving the production of energy in the little energy factories in the brain called mitochondria. And it also reduces oxidative stress. But remember, coenzyme Q10 is essential for producing aerobic energy. You cannot make it without coenzyme Q10, whether you make it yourself or you get it externally. Now, by the way, statin drugs reduce, on average, your production of coenzyme Q10 by 40%. So if you are taking statin drugs, how many people in this room are proud to say they are not taking statin drugs? Could I have a show of hands? Fantastic. That's about half the audience, and that's, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, it is, after all, the best-selling drug in the world. The, uh, yeah, statin drugs technically are hydroxyglutaryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitors that inhibit farnesyl and mevalonate, which are involved in the production of both cholesterol and coenzyme Q10. So it blocks both of them. Pardon my big words. I love big words. <laughs> now, we did supply coenzyme Q10. As I go on with the talk, you'll see a yellow line on the slide that tells you what we actually used in the trial, so you can keep track of it. And my book there, Nutrients for Memory, which we have a few outside, and they're available on my website. Uh, I do, by the way, have a downloadable version for under $10. It's the full book, if you want to read it on a tablet or computer or even a cell phone, if you have very good eyesight. S supplementary coenzyme Q10 reduce the production of amyloid plaques in the brain. That's just what we want and it stimulates mitochondrial superoxide dismutase, which I mentioned about protects the brain from cell death. When the mitochondria, the membrane gets damaged, it becomes permeable and apoptosis or programmed cell death occurs. And this is very common in Alzheimer's brains. Let's not have it common in ours. In the many studies done on coenzyme Q10, there have not been problems with safety or tolerability by people. 
very rare to have anyone react unfavorable to this very natural thing that in our bodies. One of our interventions was blueberries. They improved memory in older adults. In this randomized placebo-controlled trial, I read many studies. Some are reviews of other studies. Some are the actual study themselves. The studies I like the best are ones like this, where they actually took people and fed some blueberries and didn't feed other people blueberries, and they saw what happened. My hobby is collecting studies. So I read several studies every day, and the really good ones I rename in a special way and save, and I just passed 9,000 studies that I've saved as being really great. This is one of them. Journal of Nutrition, <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Yes, I am a nerd. Uh, <laughs> in 2018, this came out in the Journal of Nutrition, and they talked about the anthocyanins. Anthocyanins move across the blood-brain barrier. They've been found in the hippocampus memory area of the brain. They prevent oxidation and inflammation in those areas of the brain. The more, the merrier. So you can protect your brain with these. Of course, they have, as I've mentioned, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory functions. They were found in many other memory areas of the brain. So eating blueberries is not a bad intervention. I do recommend only organic blueberries because they're in the top dirty dozen of foods that have been sprayed right on the surface with pesticides. And the pesticides upon washing with soap and water were not removed, according to the physician's working group who comes out with this data every year. In the nurse's health study, they found that the nurses who ate one cup of berries daily reduced their dementia by an average of two years and a maximum of two and a half years. Just delayed their brain from disintegrating. So as I said, I put all of these different interventions together, and so can you. And you have the ability to choose. You can eat the blueberries or strawberries or red grapes. Red grapes are much cheaper and easier to eat, by the way, and they do have the anthocyanins. Or you can choose not to. This is up to you. Medical doctors tell you what to do. I'm just an educator. It's up to you to decide if you want to include berries in your diet. And of course, I hope you do, but... Um, the American Heart Association has since lowered the figure to 6% of calories as a maximum saturated fat. I'll tell you, from analyzing diets, you really can't get down to 6% and still eat any animal products. There just isn't room, because there's a little saturated fat in many, many different foods. And when you add all that saturated fat up on a whole plant diet, you're likely to get something like 4 to 6% saturated fat, which is perfect. But then when you add some one meal of animal fat, it's too high. And then you're risking your brain. What are the highest saturated fat foods? Let's see, should we ignore the one on top because coconut oil is so popular these days? <laughs> Two tablespoons of coconut oil, 24 grams. I know there's a lot of confusion about when people say medium chain, Triglycerides, which is not an exact term at all, since triglycerides always have three fatty acids and none are medium. Uh, two fatty acids is a diglyceride, one fatty acid is a monoglyceride. But they're talking about the length of the fatty acids. There are three saturated fatty acids that are very well proven to clog our arteries. That's lauric acid, myristic acid, and palmitic acid, respectively 12, 14, and 16 carbons long, otherwise identical. These three fatty acids make up 65% of coconut oil. So coconut oil is very clogging to the arteries. Also, any extracted oil is not a great idea, because when you extract an oil from a plant, say even if it's a sunflower seed with lots of vitamin E and fiber, you take out all the fiber and most of the vitamin E when you get sunflower seed oil. The oil is something like white sugar. You start with a beet and you get beet sugar. Well, you've left out a lot of good things. And you start with a sunflower seed and get sunflower oil. You've lost a lot of good things. Why not eat the sunflowers? Now, how do you do that? Well, one way is powdering them. Another way is to eat the nut butters or seed butters. Another way is to make, I, my wife has a cookbook called, she has a dementia prevention cookbook. And in it is her creamy walnut dressing, which is totally delicious, but contains a lot of the gamma form of vitamin E, 
also the essential fatty acid, alpha linolenic acid found in the walnuts, but made into a dressing so delicious that put on top of anything, you'll eat it. So that's a good way to get your uh, low saturated fat foods and make sure you want to eat them. Cheddar cheese is high in saturated fat. Two slices, those little tiny thin slices, 11 grams. How many grams do you get per day? 11 grams, that's it, on a 2,000 calorie diet. Maybe 13 grams if you eat a little bit more food. Uh, fast food cheeseburger, nine grams of saturated fat. Milk, yogurt, ice cream, all dairy products have saturated fat. And people, I mean, maybe ice cream, one cup has five grams. How many people eat one cup of ice cream? <laughs> so you, it adds up. These are the foods that you can eat all you want of without risking your arterial health, your brain health, heart attacks, or strokes. Of course, heart attacks and strokes, each of which I've written a book on, also depend upon you building a plaque in your arteries first before you can have the heart attack or the stroke. So why not tone down our arterial plaque with a low saturated fat that looks delicious? I'm gonna talk just for a couple of slides about oxidized cholesterol, known as oxysterols. Those sharp little crystals up there are what happen when you have too much cholesterol in your blood and it crystallizes and is oxidized. Now, we know that cholesterol itself only contributes to the cholesterol, and dietary cholesterol only contributes to blood cholesterol a little bit. Perhaps 10% to 15% of blood cholesterol levels are due to dietary cholesterol. However, when you cook an egg, which is very high in cholesterol, then you get oxidized cholesterol. This oxidized cholesterol, it goes into your digestion is built into chylomicrons, which are fat transporters for dietary fat, much like LDL or fat transporters for liver fat. These chylomicrons circulate the oxidized cholesterol throughout your body, 45 times more oxysterols in arterial plaque than in a healthy artery. And the problem is that they can cause, with those sharp crystals, the plaque that sits there year after year People are 40 years old with clogged arteries, 50 years old with clogged arteries, then they have a shrimp omelet. Shrimp is very high in cholesterol, so is the eggs. Then they may coalesce into cholesterol crystals, oxidize cholesterol, and break the plaque free. And that is where you get either, if it's very tiny in the brain, vascular dementia. If it's larger in the brain, you get a stroke, which can be devastating. Or in the heart, you could get a heart attack. It's probably a good idea not to eat oxidized cholesterol. They're powerful neurotoxins, and they increase brain inflammation and oxidation. They increase beta amyloids in Alzheimer's disease. In Parkinson's disease, we have Lewy body dementia sometimes, and Lewy body dementia is also very sad. Um, we have worked with people with Lewy body dementia as well, and these techniques are also very effective with Lewy body dementia. Uh, one man uh, came in the clinic, and with Parkinson's disease, sometimes people are getting too thin. So she was feeding him bacon and eggs for breakfast to bulk them up. Well, we got her to switch over to uh, actually oatmeal with avocado. Sounds funny, but he loved it. And when they came back a month later, we said, how'd it go? He said, well, we only changed breakfast. Did you notice any difference? Well, his Lewy body dementia is about 25% better. One meal, one month. What if he did all three? You can do that. I hope he's doing that now, too. So where we get oxidized cholesterol is if we're eating too much saturated fat and our blood cholesterol is raised, that cholesterol will oxidize. It then can enter. Now, cholesterol can't enter the brain, but oxidized cholesterol can. When it enters, it creates a wave of inflammation and damage to the brain. This is really not a good idea. So cooked animal foods have the oxidized cholesterol already. In our bodies, the oxidative breakdown of cholesterol creates these oxysterols that are so damaging. So basically, we don't want to eat cooked cholesterol. Actually, cholesterol is not required for human beings at all. Do you know how many Molecules of cholesterol we make in our bodies, 70 quadrillion per second. That's a lot. 
If you want to know how much we get in 24 hours, you're going to need a calculator with a really big screen. <laughs> big study in China looked at nut consumption. 40% less memory loss over two years in people who ate nuts, and the Chinese mostly eat peanuts rather than other nuts. That's their preference. So nut consumption was associated with sustained memory. An ounce of nuts daily reduced neurodegenerative disease 35% across 29 studies. So that's a different study that found that it's very effective to make sure you have enough vitamin E. The best way, sunflower seeds and walnuts. That, I think it's the best way. Vitamin E in food, they looked at 800 elders, followed them for, eight, for four years, and vitamin E lowered the odds of Alzheimer's disease 67%. Excellent. Wouldn't you like to lower your odds of Alzheimer's 67%? So in our study, as I mentioned, one ounce of walnuts, one ounce of sunflower seeds, both ground up daily. This is Cora. Cora has gotten a written permission to talk about her and her gin daughter, Ginger. Um, this is in Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience. We work with Cora for two years, once a month. And she came in in a wheelchair. And when I asked her what she had for lunch at 2 PM, no recollection. None at all. She couldn't remember anything. She couldn't find her way anywhere. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Month by month, we changed her diet. We supplemented her. We gave her the brain and body food. And month by month, she got better. After six months, she said, my knees are so painful and inflamed. That's why I'm in a wheelchair. What can I do? Well, we looked at her diet. And she was eating fast food all the time, especially chicken. Chicken's really high in this inflammatory arachidonic acid. So she had already stopped eating meat. Now she stopped eating chicken. The next month, she came back on a walker instead of a wheelchair. OK, she's getting some movement. And she's starting to brighten up. You could see the lights coming on. Over time, she graduated to a cane. Her migraines went away. Her mood improved greatly, and, uh, which is nice, because apparently she was like many people with Alzheimer's disease, a bit abusive of her caretakers. And sometimes this can be from the drugs, too. Uh, so you should ask your doctor or neurologist for an adjustment of drugs if your Alzheimer's patient is being abusive. After two years, she was able to walk up with no pain to the front of a hospital dedication in front of hundreds of doctors and read what she'd written to the doctors, saying that she was fully recovered and she can now read medical journals and when we asked her husband, how is she doing? He says, I can see no room for improvement. How's her daughter? How's her memory? Sharp. So I'm not saying everyone. Yes, thank you. And they did the work. OK, we didn't do the work. They did the work. We tell people what to do all the time, and they don't do it. <laughs> but they did the work, and I'm really proud of them. Not everyone with Alzheimer's disease can make this full, full recovery. But hey, isn't there hope at least for stopping neurodegeneration? One of the things that happens with these amyloid plaques is they get populated by advanced glycation end products. These advanced glycation end products are twisted, plasticized protein fragments that when you fry or broil or barbecue animal foods like meat or chicken or fish, these form. And then some of them are absorbed into the bloodstream, some studies doubling the bloodstream level. Then they circulate to the brain, where unfortunately we have a receptor appropriately named RAGE, Receptor for Advanced Glycation End Products. This creates an amazing amount of inflammation in the brain. And the advanced glycation end products go up and lodge in the amyloid plaques and create 50 times the free radical damage to the brain cells and destruction of brain cells. By not eating those foods, you can really relieve the burden on your brain, whether or not you have Alzheimer's disease. They're also found in arthritic joints. Good thing to avoid. Uh, so what we did is we asked people not to barbecue, broil, or deep fry any meat or animal products of any kind. And also, they're formed in hard cheeses. So we had people not do that. Guess how the compliance was? Not too good. A lot of fast foods are deep fried and crispy brown with lots of advanced glycation end products. So it was tough. It was pretty tough. The foods with advanced glycation products, chicken, bacon, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, turkey, 
you get the idea. Now, the problem with these animal products is not just advanced glycation end products. They also have or organochlorine pesticides, rancid oils if they're deep fried, harmane, which increases tremors, especially an essential tremor, very common, arachidonic acid for inflammation and pain, endotoxins for blood inflammation and brain inflammation, oxysterols, which I've mentioned, excess saturated fat, and lack of the anti-inflammatories in plant foods. Now I'm going to tell you about how amyloid plaques form in the brain. It's a bit of a detailed picture there. Here's how it works. Genes create beta secretase and, and gamma secretase. These two secretases go up and snip off the amyloid precursor protein, which is a transmembrane protein in brain cells. When they're snipped off, and they're 40 or 42 amino acids in length, they go into the brain, and they're neurotoxic. They become oligomers, they're very neurotoxic. Then they combine into fibrils, and then they become the amyloid plaque in the brain. Okay, what if those genes didn't make any gamma secretase or any beta secretase? Then there would be no more amyloid plaque formed, and more important, no more toxic, neurotoxic proteins floating around in the brain. So that was our goal here. And what stops it, what quenches these genes, now you may have the Alzheimer's genes where you're four times as likely to get Alzheimer's disease because you're making the presenilin, presenile, is one of the genes that make you more prone to have Alzheimer's disease. But SAMe quenches it, so it doesn't do anything. You may be 10 times as likely as other people. It's rare, but having two genes, SAMe quenches both of them. So you are no longer more prone to Alzheimer's disease than anyone else. In fact, less than most people if you have enough. Isn't that interesting? So quenching of the SAMe results in decreased amyloid production. In this 2018 study in molecular neurobiology, quote, thus preventing Alzheimer's disease, end quote. Uh, perhaps they're being a bit optimistic there. Uh, but it does prevent the formation of amyloid plaques, and that is well proven. People with Alzheimer's disease were found to be very deficient in SAMe. This is something we should make in our bodies all the time, but they were deficient. Vitamin B12 and folate are what creates SAMe. Greens and beans for folate, that's where you get it, those pretty pictures there. And vitamin B12, well, you're likely to get that from a supplement. Whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat, it's probably advisable to take vitamin B12. Folate lowers the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So here we're looking at risk, four times the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease if you're low in folate. These findings suggest that folate deficiency may precede the onset of Alzheimer's dis disease. So eat some greens and beans. Those with Alzheimer's disease, now we're looking at people already with Alzheimer's disease, four times as likely to have elevated homocysteine, that's what SAMe is made from, if you have B12, which was four times lower, and, SAM, and, and folate, which is three times lower. So in our trial, we supplemented vitamin B12 as a methylcobalamin form and folate as the real folate form. This study looked at preservation of brain cells, and they found that if you didn't have enough folate in B12, the gray matter was lost. If you did, it was not lost. Very close to zero loss. Where do you get enough folate? This graph shows you, this I have to give credit to McGraw-Hill for letting me use my own graph. Uh, it is, shows that uh, greens, like spinach, were the highest in folate. Greens and beans, also nuts and seeds have folate too. So if you're eating plant food, you're likely to get enough folate. Oh, I want to go back one. Oops, that's not the back button. That's the back button. On the little graph on the right, you can see on an American diet, the folate is the bar on the right. The amount of folate we need is the bar on the left. No wonder Alzheimer's is so prevalent and growing. People are not eating enough greens and beans. Vitamin B12 is another story. Clinically, most people who are vitamin B12 deficient in their blood are getting plenty of vitamin B12 in their diet, but they're not absorbing it because vitamin B12, first it has to be 
to go into the stomach and be broken free from its protein carrier. That depends on stomach acid made by the parietal cells. Parietal cells also make intrinsic factor. And the intrinsic factor is necessary to go with the vitamin B12 into the intestine in order for it to be absorbed. With this complex absorption process, it's very difficult for people who eat animal products because their fiber is low and their parietal cells are challenged by putting out a lot of stomach acid all the time. So whether you are vegan or aren't vegan, if you're vegan, of course, you're getting no vitamin B12, I think supplementation is very wise. And you can have your vitamin B12 checked in your blood. I do. You can also have your homocysteine checked in your blood. It's a good idea, and most standard blood profiles will check that. Now, SAMI also had some nice side effects. Whether you get it from folate and B12 and make it yourself, or you take it externally, it did seem to reduce senile plaques that create oxidative stress. So it's a precursor to glutathione. So it's, SAMI's very protective to the brain in other ways than just quenching and methylating the genes that make the plaques. It also reduced tau tangles. Now, in the picture here, you see that the top one is, looks like an egg, and the bottom one looks like a fried egg. The fried egg one is the tau tangle. It's a nerve cell that has been damaged by phosphorylated tau until it really can't function. The connections to other nerve cells, the dendrites and axons are lost with these. But this is very helpful. And you know, it's interesting that SAMI does have side effects. One of the side effects is it's is shown to be as powerful in reducing knee osteoarthritis pain as Celebrex, a very powerful painkiller, COX-1. So since they lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease, in our trial, we gave people 200 milligrams of SAMe. And it is really quite safe. There is one drug interaction. It should not be mixed with any antipsychotic medication, especially selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. But just don't mix it with any antipsychotic medication because it's been widely used for depression and we don't want your smile to get any bigger than hers. <laughs> so from these studies, we can see that if you just get enough vitamin B12 and folate, you can cut your risk of Alzheimer's down by about one quarter.